Hello again. Uh, Dr. Michael Ketterer, who will speak next, obtained his primary and secondary education in Buffalo, New York, and received a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Notre Dame in 1980. He pursued graduate studies in electron transfer and interfacial chemistry at the University of Colorado Boulder under the direction of Professor Carl A. Koval, receiving his PhD in 1985. After a brief employment as an industrial electrochemist, Dr. Ketterer worked from 1987 to 1993 at the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Forensic Laboratory, where he developed interests in isotope geochemistry and nuclear chemistry. Uh, Dr. Ketterer has been a faculty member and has taught chemistry courses at John Carroll University, Northern Arizona University, Metropolitan State University of Denver, and the University of Denver. His research emphasizes the prevalence and properties of actinides, for example, uranium and plutonium in the environment, with a focus on using mass spectrometry to fingerprint and trace contaminants released from U.S. nuclear sites. In the past 15 years, Mike has published and lectured extensively on detection and behavior of actinides in environmental samples. Dr. Ketterer is currently Professor Emeritus of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Northern Arizona University. And Dr. Ketterer is, is a real expert in this very specialized area. He has studied soil samples from Rocky Flats. He's studied soil samples from Piketon, Ohio, a gaseous diffusion plant and other sites around the world. Uh, everyone, please welcome Dr. Michael Ketterer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Ketterer. Uh, I'm Professor Emeritus of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. And I'm an analytical and environmental chemist, and I've done work on uh, plutonium in sites from worldwide locations, both from stratospheric fallout and from other sources. And here today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our recent work looking at plutonium dioxide particles in soils from the proximity of the former Rocky Flats site. So if we go to slide two, uh, here's an outline of what I'd like to go through with you today. Uh, I'll first address what, where is plutonium found in association with Rocky Flats and why is it there? What are the mechanisms through which it came to be? Uh, and that requires us to talk about the physico slash physical slash chemical nature of the plutonium in the soil. Uh, and what do we find today um, in terms of what types of plutonium bearing particles are present? So uh, it's known uh, from previous experiments as well as our recent work that there are plutonium dioxide particles in these soils near Rocky Flats. So I've developed a new um, radiochemical assay uh, a laboratory procedure for looking for these particles in a systematic way. I'll show you some re recent results from um, um, measuring these particles in soils collected from the proximity of the plant, but off of US government property. And then at the end, my message is I'm passing this off to the medical and toxicological community because my expertise is not in those areas. I'm not really, uh, here to talk about what harm might come from these particles, although I think it's a common sense that it's a good idea not to inhale them, but my expertise is confined really to um, uh, the an analytical part of it, finding and characterizing the particles. How much is there and where did it come from? So let's start with plutonium in soils. It is true that you can find plutonium in soils anywhere on the Earth's surface as a result of 50s and 60s nuclear weapons tests. So here's a map of the continental US and the little black uh, squares are showing areas where I've personally collected uh, soil core samples. And we measure what's called the inventory of plutonium. So this is how much cumulatively is present per unit area. So it's measured in becquerels per square meter, the summed activities of 239 and 240 plutonium. So in the continental US, you can find it anywhere and you can find relatively predictable um, 
uh, inventories. It's higher in some areas like the Pacific Northwest where there's more abundant rainfall. Um, and it's lower in other areas where there's less rainfall such as in the Southwest. However, if you look at a map of the continental US, one place that does stick out uh, quite prominently is the former Rocky Flats site. So uh, in comparison, we see that the inventories are um, uh, a factor of 10 to almost 100 higher than many other places in the US. And it's been proven in various ways that this contamination does originate from Rocky Flats. So this is a problem that's been recognized for decades, but let's not lose sight of the fact that uh, plutonium can be found in the environment in many places, but it's quite prominent at Rocky Flats. So I'm going on to the next slide, which is addressing the where and why. Well, one of the pathways by which this has come to be is that the plant was handling plutonium metal. Uh, it's a chemically reactive substance. It'll react with water, with oxygen, with the ambient air. And so at the Rocky Flats plant, they used these dry boxes handled with gloves. Um, uh, the materials were handled uh, remotely with gloves, but emissions ne nevertheless occurred. This is not a perfect process and uh, plutonium aerosols leak out into the air. So as a result of uh, several uh, well-known large fires, as well as routine smaller fires and other types of processes, um, incineration, for example, uh, this plant has generated a lot of plutonium dioxide particles, which have gone into the environment. And they range in size from nanometers to several microns uh, in size. In fact, uh, in the JPPHA 2019 studies, uh, evidence was found for an 8.8 .8 micron particle, a, a, a couple kilometers from the former plant. So the questions that I'm interested in uh, are can we detect these particles, um, nanoparticle size range, so that would be from a nan one nanometer to a thousand nanometers, or micron size particles greater than one micron, can we detect these guys in soils? And, and the emphasis here for me is soils that are off of U.S. government property, so in the neighboring communities. And a second question is, what kinds of chemical transformations uh, might have occurred in the intervening decades? Uh, some of these particles have been out there for 40, 50 years. What's happened to them chemically? Uh, have they been transformed, leached, dissolved, or anything? It's generally thought that plutonium dioxide is pretty inert chemically. Think in terms of these are little diamonds or cubic zirconia uh, as a rough analogy. But uh, um, that sort of remains an open question. Can these particles be chemically transformed? Um, another prominent source of plutonium in the soils near Rocky Flats is a place that was called the 903 path. So at this site, as shown in the photo of the barrels in the center of the picture, the uh, government stored plutonium laden solvents and cutting oils and things like that. And it would have had plutonium bearing particles and compounds and uh, unknown forms in these barrels. Well, these barrels corroded, leaked, uh, plutonium contaminated oil went into the soil and this blew uh, with the high winds, uh, mostly in an east southeast direction. And uh, uh, this area has since been excavated and is now uh, um, um, in the uh, central operating unit near where the uh, refuge uh, begins. Um, these photos were taken from uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory publication, Actinide Research Quarterly, and the subtitle here is Rocky Flats from Weapons to uh, Wildlife. So these are 2006 photos. Now there is in the literature a little bit about plutonium dioxide particles near Rocky Flats. So here's a 1978 paper done by McDowell and Wicker from Colorado State University. This is DOE funded work. Um, and they uh, use autoradiography. So it's basically like uh, uh, Rentgen's exp 
experiment with x-rays, uh, the little black spots on the photographic emulsion reveal the presence of these particles. So in their work, they took samples from uh, the former plant grounds and found an abundance. They characterized 1,700 particles, and they found an abundance of particles right in the immediate vicinity, the largest one being 6.86 microns. So this is really one of few reports that shows up in the literature or in any kind of uh, government reports about uh, plutonium dioxide particles near Rocky Flats. It seems like uh, uh, this subject has been underemphasized and more emphasis been placed on the uh, uh, 903 pad as a source of contamination. So in, in my work, I'm interested in looking for this. So as a result of all these sources of plutonium, uh, it's known in the US government has acknowledged, here's the 1970 Cray Hardy map. Uh, the US government has acknowledged that there's an excess of plutonium in soils near these areas. So think of uh, the mission here is to interrogate these soils near the plant to see if any of these PuO2 particles can be detected. Here's a similar map. This is from the LANL. 2006 publication. It has more detail, but it shows the same basic idea that there's a plume of elevated plutonium in soil to the east of the former plant. So in my work, what I've done is developed a um, laboratory procedure to look for these particles. And here's what you do. You take a soil and produce a dry uh, 75 microns uh, fraction and so this is fine sand and smaller particles, the kind of stuff that can be transported in the Chinook wind conditions, for example. And for a given soil sample, we get a bunch of this material and weigh out a lot of, a large number of 200 milligram portions, and then analyze them individually. And the basic idea that you see is that um, uh, if a plutonium dioxide particle is present, you will see a spike uh, in, ele in elevated quantity of plutonium in that particular 200 milligram fraction relative to a baseline. So I'll show you here in some detail what the results look like. The chemistry is uh, um, relatively well-established and straightforward stuff. So, in my work, we've looked at samples from the uh, immediate proximity of the plant. Here's a narrow strip of land where composites one through five are shown. These were taken with permission from Jefferson County, who has a narrow right of way along the west, immediate west uh, uh, edge of Indiana Street. And then there's a few composite soils that are taken from the Colorado Hills Open Space Park to the east. So those are the ones that I've used to look for the particles. These are in the um, immediate uh, uh, east zone in the Hardy Cray map. So on the next slide, which has an Excel sheet and a graph, what I'm showing you here is the results from one of these composites. What do you get when you analyze 30 or 40 200 milligram portions? The results look something like this. There's kind of a baseline level of contamination that uh, appears to be relatively homogeneously distributed uh, from one 200 milligram portion to the next. And I'll call that the 903 pad baseline plutonium and or uh, very small particles. On the other hand, what we see here is there's obviously two outliers from this trend and I've encircled those. And these outliers are coming because those particular 200 milligram portions have a plutonium dioxide particle. And that's what's ca causing this elevation in activity. And so what we're doing here in this work is trying to look for uh, this type of elevation in activity above a uniform baseline and ascribe that to an individual particle. So on the next slide, uh, I'm showing you that uh, if we look for deviations from this baseline, we're talking about a particle that's about 0.92 microns. It's sufficient to cause an elevation of three standard deviations above that baseline. And in this case here for composite three, we see that happens twice out of uh, uh, 30 something trials. Uh, one of them is from a 1.6 and the other is from a 1.9 micron um, PuO2 particle 
And the uh, calculations at the bottom are just showing you how we go from the concentrations found to the excess number of picograms of plutonium-239. And then that's related to the mass of PuO2 and its density is known, et cetera. So it enables the radius and diameter of the particle to be calculated. There's a number of different ways that you can use statistically to try to recognize when these outliers are present. Here's a what's called a normal probability plot, normal QQ plot, and uh, uh, the data that fall more or less within a normal distribution are shown in the line at the bottom, and then here's the two obvious outliers with attention drawn to them. And so looking at some soils that are to, further to the east of the plant across Indiana Street, uh, we do find that there as well, there's the same kind of phenomenon is occurring. So here I'm using um, yet another way of looking at the results, multiple box and whisker plots. And you can see that a lot of data points cluster down into those uh, uh, box and whiskers. And then there's a few that are above that, uh, that baseline again. And these ones encircled here uh, show you where there's plutonium dioxide particles. So looking at the results that we've got, um, plutonium dioxide particles are clearly found in all of these soils along the Indiana Street Corridor, composites one through five. Those were collected in 2019 with permission of Jefferson County. And then some archived soils that I had from long ago in, collected in 2001, they also show plutonium dioxide particles. Um, and if we look at um, the next slide, there's a histogram of uh, all of the results for all of the particles detected. And what you see here is that there's particles ranging from about 0.4 up to about 2.2 microns in size. Uh, the distribution is clustered towards the smaller particles. This is just a very limited glance at uh, uh, what might be out there. Um, however, I believe one can expect to find a lot of smaller particles that aren't large enough to show up uh, to be detected as a deviation from this baseline, as well as occasionally there can be some larger particles. So we do intend to uh, continue to do some of this work. I would expect that there's similar particles uh, found elsewhere in other areas impacted by these emissions. So one ought to look everywhere on this Hardy Cray map uh, to see what you can find. So on the, on the uh, slide entitled Future Studies, I have some ideas of what we can do in the future. There's a lot of additional data collection necessary. Um, looking in offsite uh, soils and dusts, it would be a good idea. Uh, I think we have to have a better understanding overall of the geospatial distribution of these particles. Uh, we don't know much about how chemically stable they are in the environment, nor under what conditions can they move, such as during wind events or wildfires. And I'm not going at all into uh, the um, question about what human exposure might look like and what the resultant health effects might be. All right, so here on the last slide, I have some acknowledgements. I wish to thank the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center who has supported supplies and some laboratory expenses at Northern Arizona University for conducting the work. Uh, they hired Scott Say Cheney uh, uh, to assist with some of the laboratory work. Uh, Northern Arizona University provides the site and the radioactive materials license for this work. And I also wanna thank the Ingram Lab uh, for cooperation and sharing in the ICPMS facility. And thank you for your attention.